So the reason you prepare is to be ready for what you want to do or what you think is going to happen. Anybody here ever gone camping? It's very wise to prepare. <laughs> because if you don't, uh, you're going to go hungry, you're going to be uncomfortable, and you have to prepare not only for what could happen that's good, things you want to do, but for things like rain. We prepare for uh, blizzard storms. Hard to think about such things right now. Uh, we prepare for bad weather, for power outages. Uh, we prepare for something as simple as if I'm driving somewhere and it's, it's a Buffalo Bills game. I want to calculate my time going through Buffalo because if you are going through Buffalo as the game is getting out, you are not going anywhere. So preparation reduces our stress. And this is really important because Jesus is going to talk to us about end time realities. And the simple truth is, is that we often feel more stress when we talk about that conversation, but Jesus intends to reduce our stress. How many are okay this morning if Jesus reduces your stress? Oh, that's great, all right? And Jesus told his disciples that to, they, if you listened to Sarah's message last, last week, how, how many really appreciated and enjoyed that message? Wasn't it great? Yeah. That, that is a hard act to follow, I'm just telling you. And uh, Jesus had told uh, the disciples that all the buildings they saw, including the temple, was going to be completely razed. There literally would not be one stone left upon another. And, uh, and when he said that, no one said anything for a little while. The next thing you know is they're sitting out on the Mount of Olives and uh, they start asking him questions. They ask him two questions. And uh, in verse three, it says, as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? The disciples asked two questions. That's really important because Jesus actually gives two answers. And if we turn them into one answer, there are some things that, that don't seem to fit or make sense to us. So the first question, when will the destruction of the temple happen? The second question, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answers both questions. So let's start in verse 32 of chapter 24. It says, now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near, right at the door. Uh, truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away. My words will never pass away. Uh, most of the trees in that area of the world are actually evergreens. They, they don't shed their leaves in the winter, but there are two trees in that area of the world that do. And one is the almond tree and the other is the fig tree. And Jesus calls attention that when you see the leaves coming out on the tree, you know that the winter is ending and summer is coming. And he says, when you see these things, all of these things happening, and if you remember from last week, there was a whole series of, of challenging circumstances and tribulations that Jesus said, these are going to happen. When you see those things happen, then you know that that destruction of the temple is near. It's right at the door. And that generation is the one who will see it happen. And the very generation that Jesus is speaking to is the one who saw that happen. In 70 AD, Jerusalem was destroyed by Rome and, and its temple was destroyed, literally in the same generation. Then Jesus begins to answer the second question. What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus tells us heaven and earth will pass away, but his words will not. What he's telling us is that his words are actually more dependable than nature, and nature's pretty dependable. Like the, the moon comes up, th this month is actually, we get a, a two super moons in, in, uh, in August, it's, it's unusual. And by the way, in case you're interested in August 13th, when it's a new moon and there's no moon in the sky, we are also at the peak of a meteor shower. So if it's a clear night, you should see between 20 and 40 shooting stars across the sky per hour. Something to look forward to. That's if the Canadian smoke isn't blocking it out. So I'm, I'm, I'm censoring myself right now. <clears throat> 
Heaven and earth will pass away. Nature's fairly dependable. You can tell when the moon is going, we're going to have a, 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 a solar eclipse coming. You can, actually can't rent any place in Rochester right now on the day that that's going to happen next year because everybody knows when it's going to happen. They're, they, they're already taking up every hotel room and Airbnb they can possibly find because nature is dependable. The seasons are going to come. We know this, right? Summer is short, winter is long because of where we live. It's, it's dependable. I'm not saying we like it, but it's dependable. So Jesus talks about this, and what he's telling us is really interesting. He's telling us about what to do in the in-between, between the time that he tells us these things and the time that these things are going to happen. What are we supposed to do? And what he wants us to know is in this in-between time, it's his words that actually keep us. It's his words that bring life to us. So in Matthew 24, verse 36, it said, but about that day or hour, no one knows, not the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. This brings us to a powerful point. No one knows the day or the hour of the end of all things. Only God. He's the only one. Now, some people think that Jesus was just pretending not to know so the disciples would not pester him with more questions. And uh, from what we know about Jesus in the Gospels, he doesn't pretend anything. He's very consistent. He's not, he's not just saying this to avoid additional questions. He's telling us two things, and both these things are important. He doesn't know. By the way, if you were making up a gospel narrative, you wouldn't say that about Jesus. The only reason you would put it there is because it has to be true, because for Jesus not to know something sounds embarrassing. The second thing, the re reason, is because Jesus wants us to know that no one else knows either. That when people who claim to follow Jesus claim to know more than Jesus does, we should be concerned. And there is a whole history book of people who thought they, they calculated the day and the hour. And they convinced people to sell their houses and go stand out on hills and look up into the sky and wait. And all of those people walked away disappointed and poor because of it. No one knows the day or the hour. The other thing he tells us here is that he is the son which is quite a remarkable uh, declaration to make. So if Jesus doesn't know when this will happen, we don't know what happens. And this, and this isn't just this conversation. He actually tells us in Acts, after his resurrection, he's talking to his disciples. Do you know what question they ask him? Then they gathered around him and asked, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but... You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Jesus keeps reminding us, it's not for us to know. All the time we spend trying to calculate when the Antichrist is going to be revealed, when Jesus might return, Jesus says, it's not for us to know. Just look at the person next to you. You have to smile when you say this or they'll get angry. So put your smile on first and then say, it's none of your business. <laughs> Just, yeah, right? It's none of our business. Then in verse 37, as it was in the days of Noah, Jesus says, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days of Noah, uh, before the flood, people were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. This is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. What is Jesus saying? There's no way to know. There's no specific thing that will happen that will, will clue you in. Oh, that's when it's going to happen. Before the flood, people were eating. How many, here peop how many have eaten? There should be more hands. I saw how many donuts walked in here this morning. I, you're not just looking at those things, I know. And, and drinking, and, 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 and this is like the, the summer of weddings. It's just a lot of weddings happening. And what's he saying? Life is going to be very normal. Very normal. 
Mark's Gospel only devotes five verses to this dialogue. Matthew is almost 60. We're getting a lot more information here. As in the days of Noah, people didn't understand. They were clueless. They didn't know what was about to happen. So Jesus tells us how normal things will be before he returns. We can't predict the end of the age, but we can prepare. We can't predict, but we can prepare. The problem in Noah's day was that there was huge indifference to spiritual things, and they didn't care about what an end would look like. Noah did, and as a result, he was prepared when the flood came. I think a lot of people live today without thinking about the end of their own lives, much less the end of life as we know it. So what does Jesus say about his coming? Two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken, the other left. Who does Jesus return for? Not special people. What place does Jesus return to? Not religious settings. What are the people doing that he returns for? They're working. This is important. Taking the return of Jesus seriously does not mean we take work less seriously. It's amazing how many people think that work doesn't matter just because they're thinking spiritual thoughts. And what's interesting is the workers are doing the same jobs. It's not like there's, there's holy work and there's unholy work. The men are in the field. The women are, are grinding a, a, a wheat. Like They're all engaged in the same kinds of activities. There doesn't seem to be much of a difference. Peter would talk about it this way in 1 Peter, the first chapter. He says, therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, Set your hope on the grace that is to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed it is coming. See, we cannot calculate the date of Christ's return. What we have to do is look forward to something. And this is interesting. When Peter talks about this, it's not looking forward to something that you fear. It's looking forward to something that is good. What does he say? To the grace that is going to be revealed. Isn't that an interesting way to think about end times? I was raised in a house where when we talked about end times, and I was raised in a church when we talked about end times, it was terrifying. And as a child, I used to be worried that Jesus would come and go, and I would miss out. And I can remember coming home one time, and nobody was in the house. I was just a kid walking home from school, and nobody was in the house. And my thought was, Jesus came, and I missed it. Anybody else ever do that? Yeah. If, if that never happened to you, good. That did not make me more spiritual. It didn't. So Jesus tells us to be aware, be alert, pay attention. To what? Are we supposed to be constantly going with one eye up in the sky, just seeing if, is, is, is he coming? No. He gives us quite a remarkable different thing to focus on, and it's surprising. How do we prepare? Not by standing in hills and looking into the sky. How do we prepare? This is what it says in Matthew 24, verse 42. Therefore keep watch, be prepared. You do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of a house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour that you do not expect him. If you've ever had someone break into your house, they never send you advance notice. They never say, somewhere around 1230, if you guys could be gone, that would make it easier for me. That's not what they do. There's not a way. Being ready is not about predicting the time. Being ready is about something else. And what's interesting here is that he said, you be ready, and you is not just the individual. It actually is in the plural in the Greek, which means it's to everybody that he's talking to, that the way we make ourselves ready is actually to be part of a community. It's far less individual than we think. 
So Jesus tells us the truth about life, and, and he does it because he doesn't want us to be anxious, and he doesn't want anybody to deceive us. He doesn't want us to be terrified. He doesn't want us to spend all our time trying to solve the prophetic puzzle. The good news is to help us live ready for what scripture tells us is going to happen. So Jesus is going to give four parables. We're going to cover two of them today and two next week. And this is the first one, verse 45. Who then is faithful and a wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. Truly, I tell you, he will put him in charge of all of his possessions. But suppose that that servant is wicked and says to himself, my master is staying away for a long time. And then he begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and in an hour he is not aware of it. And now it's gonna get rough, all right? So this is, we've moved from G-rated literature to uh, parental discretion is advised. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus opens the parable with a question. He wants to clarify the purpose of the story that he's about to tell. And he tells us that the faithful and the wise servant, the thoughtful person in this, is someone who's not just looking to the sky, he's looking to the table, that he has been appointed the responsibility of making sure that other servants are well fed so that they can do their work. And so preparation, this is really interesting, isn't it? We're not looking to the sky, we're looking to the people that we can help nourish. That requires being thoughtful and creative because he gives food to the servants at the proper time. How many here have ever been offered to eat when you were not hungry? How many here are never not hungry? Yeah. I'll, I'll do this thing at home where I'll come home and Sue is, is making dinner and I'll reach into the cupboard and I'll pull out a bag of tortilla chips and I'll start munching on the tortilla chips. We've been married for almost 37 years and she says to me, you're going to spoil your dinner. And I say to her, we've been married for almost 37 years. When did you ever see me not eat my dinner? This is just my hors d'oeuvres, right? <laughs> Jesus says to give the other servants their food at the proper time. Feed my sheep. Nourish the people God places in your life. God's word needs to be taught. Everybody knows that's my job, but it's your job too, because we can encourage each other. We can participate in small groups, not just by sitting in a chair, but opening our hearts and opening our mouths and sharing our thoughts and our insights and letting the wisdom of God's word go from our head to our heart. We can instruct and teach our children. We can have conversations with our family. We can share God's word. That's spiritual food, that's revelation, but we can also share it at the proper time, which is relevance to talk about the thing that actually matters in the moment. Uh, teachers, uh, if you ask a teacher, uh, what do you teach? What we usually mean by the question is, what subject matter do you teach? But teachers don't just teach math, they teach students. And in our faith, we're not just teaching biblical information, we're sharing with real people. And so this is, listen, this is how you are prepared. Do you want to be prepared for Jesus' return? You want to be wise? You want to be thoughtful? You want to be good? Pay attention for opportunities when you can share something from your heart that's enriching to those who hear it from God's word. Does that sound overly hard? It's not at all. It will be good for that servant. Not looking to the sky, looking to the table. But there's another way this servant could live. 
And he could say that my master is staying away for a long time. And the thing is, is that when we make the Lord distant, we make him not Lord at all. And he starts doing some things that are really interesting. He starts misusing and abusing the people that he's supposed to be serving. And he starts spending a lot of time on his own pleasure and eating and drinking with drunkards. He, he's living a life that is that proves he doesn't think that his Lord or his master is returning anytime soon. There's violence, there's abuse, there's demeaning behavior, words that go along with that. And so we live with the expectation and hope. When we live with an expectation and hope, we treat people in a certain way. What you're expecting will affect how you treat people. And when we live without expectation and hope, we treat people in a very, very differently. This is a powerful truth to remember. So the servant treats people harshly. He's spending a lot of his time getting drunk and pleasure and excess just tends to dominate his thinking. And Jesus reminds us, our life is not a joke. Our life is not a joke. What did he say? The master of that servant will come on a day he does not expect him. And at an hour he is not aware. And he will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites where they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What does this mean to cut into pieces. Another translation of this can be to cut off. He's, he's separated from the community. And he will sign him a place with the hypocrites because living unprepared is hypocritical. Mistreating others is hypocritical. One of the challenging things in Christianity right now in Western culture is the new idea that has gained so much prominence that we can say very harsh, unkind, and unchristian things to people because they deserve it. And we've convinced ourselves all we're really doing is telling the truth. And Jesus cuts that idea down to pieces. And he says, there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, I have an idea about this, and you can think about it. And uh, maybe you want to tell me what you think about it. But it says weeping and gnashing of teeth. Weeping, I think most people think of weeping as, as in terms of remorse. Like the servant is going, oh, I wish I hadn't done that. Gnashing of teeth is a picture of anger. Maybe you've had someone so angry in your mouth, they actually don't use their teeth to talk. They talk right to their teeth. They're so angry. That's, that's what that means. It's like grinding your teeth. And uh, I don't think you can marry those two things together. I don't think the servant is weeping because he's sorry what he did. I think the servant is weeping because he feels like he's been treated unjustly. And he's angry that he was held accountable. I think most Christians think that when people, if they wind up in hell, they're just going to be in hell all the time. Oh, I wish I made another choice. Oh, I, mean, I don't think people in hell are like that at all. I think people in hell are convinced they're right. And all they are is angry. All they are is angry. Um, this servant is angry because he was held accountable. Uh, Matthew 25, verse 1, at that time the kingdom of heaven will be like. So now he's showing us something future tense. All of Jesus' parables about the kingdom, he always says the kingdom is like. Now he's saying it will be like. Ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, five wise. The foolish ones took their lamps, but did not take any oil with them. And the wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. And at midnight, the cry rang out, here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, give us your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there's not enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet and the door was shut. Later, the others came and said, Lord, Open the door for us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch. Be prepared, because you do not know the day or the hour. The story, we're, we're already made uncomfortable. Ten virgins. And uh, we don't like the use of that word. 
because of what it represents to us versus what it represented to the culture Jesus was talking to. For a person to not be married and not sexually involved, that was considered an honorable thing back in Jesus' day. In our day, it's just considered an embarrassment. If a person is not sexually involved, they don't even want to acknowledge that to other people because our culture basically teaches that if you can somehow manage control of your desires, that reveals one of two things about you. Either you lack desire or you're undesirable. So our culture has no respect for people who control their sexual appetites. And usually, if you are controlling your sexual appetite, it's not something that you readily acknowledge. In fact, you might even be dishonest about it. That's not the people that Jesus is talking to. He's talking to a very different group, where that's something that they did not think was embarrassing. And there's not a lot to distinguish between these 10 women. There's five wise and they're five foolish, but, and, and they all fell asleep. So what was the distinction? And the distinction had to do with, with their preparation. Five brought oil with them and five did not bring oil with them. This is fascinating to me. I, uh, I think I've told you, Matthew has been a really challenging gospel to preach through because he's, he's complex and he refers a lot of times to Old Testament. He puts out thoughts that you have to think about it. It's not always obvious. Let's see what you think about this. The first example of foolishness, someone thought, the master is not coming for a very long time. The second example of foolishness, the master will be here any second. How can that be foolish? Because they made no preparation. There's a way that we can think. If, Jesus, if we think Jesus is coming any moment, there's some things that become less important to us. We don't prepare. That it's not about whether you think Jesus is coming a long time away or a short time away. We can be foolish in any of those assumptions. Jesus is actually telling us, prepare like it's going to be a while, but stay alert like it's any moment. And how do we stay alert? We stay alert and we pay attention and we are aware by doing two things. One is to be prepared. If, if God is asking you to do something for him, prepare for that. But it's also by finding ways to nourish those around us on a daily basis. That when we do that, that is how we are prepared. It's a fascinating thing. Living out the gospel in our life takes preparation. It, it is great to come to a service where everything is prepared for us. How many are glad the donuts were there? I was. And I didn't even eat a donut. I was just glad that because they were there, people would not complain about them not being there. It's kind of like that, right? But how do we prepare ourselves? It's great to experience God, but how do we serve God? It's unwise, it's unwise to assume that what we have right now is enough. We can grow, we can mature, we can learn, we can develop, we can invest in our understanding of Scripture, we can be equipped to serve others. That's part of the preparation. I wish I could tell you that an experience with God is enough. You have an experience and you will be changed the rest of your life. Scripture does not agree with that. There were Israelites who traveled for 40 years in the wilderness of one experience after the other from an entire Egyptian army being destroyed as they walked through a mighty uh, uh, deliverance in the Red Sea to the supernatural supply of water and, and manna or bread every morning for them. I and mean, all these things that God did, victory after victory and experience after after experience, and they never changed. They never changed the way they thought. They came out of slavery and they lived like slaves the rest of their lives. Experiences are good, but they're not enough. And if all we do is seek an experience, 
we will not be prepared for what God is calling us to do. So oil can represent a lot of things. It represents God's purposes. For example, kings and priests in, in Scripture were actually anointed with oil. It was God is setting them aside to do something. Oil can represent healing and restoration. James 5 talks about anointing people with oil when you pray for them when they're sick. Oil can represent understanding and guidance, that the Holy Spirit can guide and direct us. The example of, of, of having oil to light the lamp in the house so that the light can shine. Um, oil can represent gladness and celebration. Uh, Psalm 45 talks about that, the oil of joy. While we are waiting for Christ to return, we can invest in how God is setting us apart. We can invest in the healing and restoration of others. We can invest in understanding more of God's purpose in our lives and in our world. We can invest in the gladness and the celebration of coming together and remembering what God has done for us and noticing what God is doing for us. The door was locked when I asked the worship team to come up. What a great time to ask them to come up. The door is locked. Worship team, come up. <laughs> the opportunity was lost. I think this is important to hear. Jesus loves us as we are. If you didn't change one thing in your life, God will not love you less. You may have done some things that you regret, feel embarrassed about. Maybe you've never even told anyone. God does not love you less. You may have walked out of relationships. You may have done things that were illegal, unethical, improper. God doesn't love you less. There's not a single thing you can do or will not do that will make God love you less. God accepts us as we are, but he loves us too much to leave us as we are. That he has hopes and dreams of what our life could be. And because of his love, he instructs and he teaches and he trains and he equips and he invests and he places us in community not just so we can learn, but so we can serve. And when we do that, we're prepared. When the lightning flashes from the east to the west and the Son of Man returns, we'll have nothing to fear. You won't miss it. Sarah told us that last week. You won't miss it. And if you're serving the table, if you're serving the table, if you're spending time being equipped for the next thing, you won't miss anything God is going to do in your life. Let's bow our heads this morning. Father, thank you for your wisdom. I'm so grateful that the words of your son take our fear away. Not just peace, but actually hope is added to our lives. Would you help us take seriously the words of Jesus today? Would you help us open our eyes to see how we can serve those at the table? Would you help us be prepared and invest in ways that helps us continue to be ready for you? Not to be foolish by assuming you're coming late and not to be foolish by assuming that you're coming right this moment, but to live in a way that we're always prepared. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.